cats are away. The cats are playing, man. And, oh, it's the other way around, isn't it? When the cats are... Yeah. Well, all I know is that one of the groovy things about being on on a Saturday night is uh, we just know there ain't nobody out there. And we just know that all those guys on the 23rd floor are sitting on a fan tail of their yacht somewhere with their ear plugged into something else. So uh, we can <laughs> we can just say the real stuff. So bring it up there, Large. Will you keep it? Oh. Now, you know what time of the year this is, and you know what this week is, huh? You do, huh? I want to tell you, I'm a little nervous right now at this point. Uh, every year, of course, we're, we're such such fantastic creatures of habit. Uh, oh, by the way, did you know that the flipper, the uh, the dolphin? No, he's not a dolphin. He's a porpoise, isn't he? Flippin, flipper, the porpoise, is now making a triumphant tour of West Germany. <laughs> And you thought it was only in America. <laughs> so let's uh, celebrate then. Let's salute uh, Flipper out there. A great American. Carrying the... <laughs> yes, we tonight would like to take a little moment to salute great Americans of the past who have carried our way of life to the four corners of the globe. Who can forget Donald Duck? Mickey Mouse. The Irrepressible Flipper. Gentle Ben. And for God's sakes, don't forget Snoopy. And so tonight, we would like to salute all those great Americans who have carried our way of life to the four corners of the globe. All right, all right. Now reset that, Keith. We're going to need that. Hey, has it ever occurred to you, though, that, that about every... Every, uh... Roughly generation, now I'm using generation in its proper sense. Most people today use generation. If a guy's three years younger than you are, he's another generation. <laughs> you know, uh, no, so that, that isn't true. Generations are roughly a quarter of a century apart. And uh, I know that's a hard pill for a lot of you to swallow, but it is true. A generation in, in uh, genetic, genetical terms is roughly a quarter of a century apart. So in one century, you can only have about four generations. But uh, nevertheless, uh, every generation, roughly, there has been a great animal character that has become a worldwide fantastic thing, in, in, at least in the 20th century. I mean, it transcends everything. Uh, for example, uh, well, Mickey Mouse uh, in the 30s. Mickey Mouse was a great world character. And everyone in the world, it was they were all hung on this mouse. Nobody quite knew why it was a mouse. Well, mice are out. Uh, and poor poor Mickey is uh, roughly relegated to the dust heap of uh, great animal characters. Do you know that there was one before that that was a great world animal character that uh, took over everybody, had something like it, they, they bought them and stuff all over the world. And it was roughly a generation before Mickey. Well, have you ever heard of the teddy bear? Well, the teddy bear was a bear that uh, was designed about the time, from what I've heard, about the time, roughly the turn of the century, or a little bit after. But the, and it was named after who? That's right, Teddy Roosevelt. And uh, that's right. And the teddy bear was a giant world phenomena. Everybody in the world had teddy bears. And that was not just America. It was the whole world got ape on teddy bears. And then all of a sudden, the uh, teddy bear went out of uh, style. And, and uh, that's the, he, he still remains, but he's not the big world phenomena that he once was. Now we're in the middle of a Snoopy phenomena. That the entire world now, everywhere you go, in fact, I've, so, I've seen it in, in uh, foreign countries all over. You see Snoopy. Now, we're, there, that means people are hung on this dog. But it's always some kind of an animal, very simple. And uh, I suppose if you want to become very uh, uh, esoteric about it and you know, technical about it, you can, you can even show that there are certain similarities in the drawings. Uh, the, the you know they all have long the big ears prominent ears if you notice each one of those has has a prominent ear the uh, 
uh, yeah, and the nose. They all have that nose sticking out. Very good, that's true. They all have the same kind of a nose. And so maybe there is something uh, subconscious, some kind of a psychological thing that makes this thing go. And uh, most people hardly know any of the other characters in uh, Peanuts, the, car- the cartoon character, but they all know Snoopy. Snoopy has transcended all of them. And as a matter of fact, uh, there was another character that had a brief flurry that was very similar that rose out of another uh, cartoon strip. And this was also in the 30s. This was uh, maybe the transition between uh, Mickey and uh, Snoopy. What was that character? Well, now, this one didn't, didn't achieve... In fact, he became so famous that a lot of stuff was named after him, but uh, he didn't achieve the... Uh, the wild uh, acclaim, the Jeep. There was a character called the Jeep that was in uh, in Popeye, and uh, and that was what the Jeep really was named after him. Uh, after that, uh, the Jeep car that we know today was named after the Jeep. And you know why they called him the Jeep? Well, why they called the car the Jeep? Because the Jeep was famous for one thing. He was like an early schmoo. The Jeep, <laughs> the Jeep could do anything, and so so could the Jeep, the, the Jeep car. But I don't know how I got on this whole thing, but uh, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting to me. All of a sudden, I see the uh, Snoopy thing all over the world, and I've, I've thought about that. You know, I thought, what is it that we're hung on cartoon animals? What is this, uh, this hang-up? Uh, Winnie the Pooh is another classic example of a hang-up on it. And, and Winnie the Pooh looks almost exactly like uh, all those other cartoon characters with the long nose, the ears. Uh, and yet, my favorite animal of all, of all the animal types that have been created, what a groovy animal! I mean, what a what a terrific uh, character, well realized character, was Mr. Toad uh, of Wind in the Willows. Uh, I I I think Wind in the Willows is probably <laughs> I mean his hang up on automobiles and all that. He had it all going, and uh, and I've often wondered why somebody doesn't bring back uh, the I think the best thing that uh, Disney ever did was Wind in the Willows. With uh, Mr. Toad, you know, being the being Mr. Toad, but uh, nevertheless, uh, how I got started on this whole thing was that uh, I was a little bit nervous here a couple of days ago. I'm walking around through the dime store, and uh, always, always at this time of the year, the first week of September, right after, right after Labor Day, it's a kind of trepidation. Do you feel this? You know, most of us, no matter who we are, spent a good, probably a good third of our lives in school. If not a third, at least a good portion of our lives, and very important time of our life, from about the time we were five or six to roughly uh, our late teens, early 20s. Now, that is the formative time of your life. This is when you're being molded and formed. And uh, not only formally in the sense of uh, being taught geography or how to read or being taught uh, uh, formal education, you also form strange little uh, un, almost unspoken, unconscious things deep down inside your gut that you don't even know you got, but they're always there. What always happened one week after the big holiday after Labor Day. School started. That was a that was a whole nervous moment. Now, why was it nervous? Well, we were, most of us were going from one grade to the next, and we had a new teacher. It's a whole new a whole new uh, ball game, and. Uh, the kids, the, you were going to see kids that you had not seen all summer. You were going to see them again. Maybe. Some of them would move away. Uh, other kids would come. And it was a time of, of real uh, transition. And uh, you, were, you were both nervous and excited at the same time because we're always drawn towards these things. And at the same time, we're scared of change. I wonder, I'm going to, I'm going to do something tonight. I'm going to make, a, make an experiment tonight. A really serious experiment, and uh, I want you to attempt to, to uh, because it involves us, it involves you, it involves me, and it, it, it's us. In other words, the corporate us. Now, I want you to try to, to get all other subjects out of your mind for a minute. 
Forget about, uh, you know, the Mets game or whatever it is for, for just this minute. Can you remember? Now think very hard. Your absolute first day in school. Now you had one. Don't come and say, wow, what do you mean? You had a first day. Can you recall it? Now come on, it's there. If you say you can't remember it, it's because you're really not concentrating. You did have a first day, and it did make an impression on you. <laughs> I can guarantee you that. Now, the trick is to get that impression out so that you can look at it. It's like a pair of socks that you've lost in your apartment. Just because you can't find them does not mean that they're not there. The trick is finding it. Well, the other day, I am walking through Woolworth, right here on Broadway, Times Square. And I'm a great Woolworth fan. I love to go to Woolworths. I don't know what it is about Woolworths. It just excites me to see the name. Are there certain stores that excite you? I mean, you see the name of them? Well, I happen to have a Woolworth hang-up. I dig Woolworths. <laughs> I, I mean, first of all, uh, there's just a, there's a certain sensuality about Woolworths. There's the, 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 these, these, you know, there's a certain type of girl that works in Woolworth. And the, she's, uh, there's a very sensual quality about it. You know what I mean? And the, you go downstairs in Woolworths. I, I particularly dig the downstairs part of Woolworths. They have all this, uh, this wo hardware type stuff and, uh, and plants and birds and all kinds of strange stuff you'll find downstairs at Woolworth. Upstairs is the straight stuff. You know, cosmetics, candy, the usual stuff. You go downstairs and you're going to get exotica. True exotica. And I, I, I like to go downstairs and Woolworth just sort of, you know, walk around down there. Well, the other night, I had nothing to do. And uh, I, I had a couple of hours to kill. I had just finished a, some kind of a, an official type meeting someplace and my show was going to be on, and, and uh, I wandered through Times Square. I spent most of my life in Times Square. How would you like that your neighborhood, friends, to be Times Square? Well, it's my neighborhood. <laughs> I mean, that's my neighborhood. It really is. And, uh, so I, I'm, you know, hanging around the old neighborhood, and the Woolworth is our candy store in this neighborhood, see? So I, I, uh, I drift in, and, and I, I note uh, as I drift past that there's a new check on the candy counter now. I, I'm so... I'm so hip to this Woolworth down here that I can even tell when they, they change, you know. The girl comes in and, and uh, they painted the ceiling and stuff like that. So I drift downstairs and I'm moving around and then I see these signs all over. It says, Back to School Specials. And it hit me. A little tiny, just a tiny tingle. And I go upstairs, I walk around again, I see all these notebooks and junk and back to school. Now, this is not nostalgia we're talking about here. Forget nostalgia. We're not discussing nostalgia. Get it out of your mind. We are talking about an experience we all went through. Now, even the youngest kid listening to me, I presume there aren't many preschool kids listening, but I would say that the youngest kid, he also went through this. It's one thing that binds us all, regardless of sex, race, you name it. We all, all of us, had a first day in school. Now, even if you only went to school through the third grade and quit, doesn't matter. You still had that first day. That sudden impact of the bureaucracy, the, uh, the organized, the communal world that was outside. The thing that makes this such a traumatic moment in most people's lives is that this is really their first personal involvement where they have to take a place in that official world outside of the home. So the average kid, he's got his little thing going in the house, see? I mean, his life. And he, uh, you know, he sits down at the table and they give him, the, they give him a scarf. You know, he sits down and he eats the meatloaf. And, <laughs> and, you know, he goes out the back and he plays ball with Heine and all the crowd and, at the, he's got a little thing going, you see. And all of a sudden, 
a big finger comes out of the sky and points at him. The time has come. Your time has come. Up to this time, all the other people in the family have been marching out to things. The old man every day goes to work, we'll say. Uh, maybe his, uh, there's a sister or a brother in the family. That one has always gone out and done this thing. It's a mysterious thing that happens away from the house, see. And uh, if they come back at night, and all of a sudden through the window comes a mysterious, ephemeral, ghost-like hand that points at little Clarence. Just points right at him, see. And he's sitting there. He's knocking down a meatloaf. He's eating his meatloaf and his cabbage. And he's eating away there. The big hand points. We want you. And he looks up. He says, who, me? We want you. It is your time, Clarence. And Clarence, driven by vast forces of of life, times, death and truth, history, convention, all of it, it's all tied up in one big ball of wax. Clarence is about to really experience the first major, irrevocable, total, complete milestone of his life. And from that day on, from that day on. Old Clarence is swimming in that same old big old river with all the rest of us. Yeah, with the dead toads and the lily pads, the bullheads, the catfish, the rushes and the mud. Clarence is swimming in that great big old river. That river called mankind. He has stopped being a kid. He has moved out of that old nest and he's now one of us. Yeah. Now sometimes Clarence drags his feet. Other times he tries to swim on his back. Blow bubbles up at the sky. Then there are times he says, Well, I'm going to dive way down here to the bottom. And see what it's like down there in the bottom. And he dives down there. Then he's got to take a breath. He comes back up. Then he floats along with us. All of us. Just drifting on down that great big old river. Hey, I'm going to sleep out in the kitchen. Put my feet in the hall. Because, baby, I know what you've done to me. You know, you ain't going to push me around. No more. Just no Hey, do 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 ba, ba ba be ba ba boo ba. I was gonna walk until my hat floats. Ba ba boo ba boo ba ba boo ba 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 boo boo ba ba boo 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 ba ba boo ba 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 boo doo. Oh, that old river. Ba ba boo boo. Don't say nothing, just keeps rolling on. Ba ba boo boo. That old river don't cry, don't weep, don't do nothing. Just keeps rolling along. Ba ba boo. So we're not talking about nostalgia, friends. Get it out of your skull. Stop it. We're not talking about the old days. Get it out of your beans. Stop it. We is talking about L I F F. E E E, life. You dig, Keith? <laughs> you dig. And it ain't nothing like it. It's the only thing we all got, and the best thing we all got. You look up that old sky once in a while. You say, you know, there's one thing that's that you got to say about me. I'm walking around, and there's a sky over me, and I can see it. I can feel it. I can smell it. Well, I remember the first time. I remember that first, that very first day that I went to school. The very first day. 
Now, how, how I remember this, well, it's probably the same reason why you remember your first day. <laughs> In fact, I know it's the same reason. But why I happen to be able to pull it out of my, my vast Kodachrome file of busted up slides of memory is because, one, that happens to be my profession. You know, my job, the work that I've chosen in life, is mostly, totally introspection. And then transmitting it out. That's what an artist does, really. He pulls things out of his memory and his, his, uh, his uh, perceptive nerve endings, and he tries to pour it into some form where he can tell the other people, see what it is. It's what Norman Mailer does. It's what all people who attempt to interpret life do, whether they're doing it on the radio or television, movies, newsreels, sculptor, or scratching it in the sand or writing dirty words on the subway. They're all trying to say it, whatever it is. Nobody can quite grab a hold of it and say why they say it, but they do, and that's it. Squirrels do not write short stories. They do not. There has been no recorded instance of a bear sitting down, taking his felt tip pen in hand, and starting out, call me Ishmael. Never. <laughs> man, yes. Bears, no. It's one of the great differences between man and beast. I <laughs> make no moral judgment on that. It is a difference. But that first moment of going to school, I will repeat to you, because it, uh, it, uh, it was there, and it is there. It's there with you. If a, an eight-year-old kid listening to me right now, that milestone that he went through is just as far back in his memory as if you're 90 listening to me. Now, that's hard to believe. But it's true. It is definitely true. Because to an eight-year-old kid, his life has been going on forever. And that moment when he went to school the first day, which was three years ago, is a half a lifetime almost back. <laughs> it's a long time. If you're 60 and you went to school that first day, it doesn't seem any longer ago to you than the eight-year-old kid. Believe it or not. It's true. There's a lot they don't know yet about memory, perception of time, all these these uh, convex, circular, uh, concave uh, mathematical structures that exist in the fourth dimension around us. And so there I am. See, I remember it so it's vivid. I'm, I'm <laughs> I have already by the time you know by the time you go to school, you already form. You've got your ideas of what school is about because you know you're going to go. Everybody talks about school. You're going to go to school. Oh, are you in school yet, Jeannie? Mm -hmm. When do you go? Mm -hmm. you, know, you know that you're going to go to school one day. Now, I happen to be the oldest kid in my family, so I was the first kid to go to school. My brother was younger. And so I'm... I'm got all these ideas of what school is about. And I even remember the, my, my, my image of what's, what I thought school was going to be. I had seen pictures of, this, of classrooms with desks. The desk itself was very, very, very uh, attractive to me. The idea of having a desk... You know, little kids love desks. They love to sit at a little table, their own little thing, saying, pile stuff on it. <laughs> at the, have their desk, their desk. And we never lose that, by the way. Oh, there's nothing that a man likes better than his desk. His place where his little business goes on, where there's, you know, just sitting at it, sending out the bills. It's, it's his desk. Desks have always had a mystical importance in people's minds. And uh, this goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. And so I'm this little kid, see, and I can remember, man, you know, uh, the idea of having a desk and being in school and uh, 
at the with all these kids and, at the and and I always pictured school too to have something to do with reading and and uh, I was a fanatical reader and uh, and I don't want you know don't don't <laughs> I was an early reader a lot of people are late readers again that has nothing to do with intelligence really much it's just to do with a lot of things that happen in your family and I was an early reader and I could read by the time I was about four and I could read well and so my whole idea of school was that I would go to school and, and that we would read and uh, and we'd have the desk. I would have this desk, see. And every time they have pictures in the, uh, in ads, for example, about school, what do they always show? Pencils. They always show pencils. And they always show tablets. And, and uh, they always show uh, a kid standing by a desk uh, and wearing a you know a little jacket or something, a like back to school special and so forth. They show blackboards. And they show uh, uh, somebody's drawn a picture of a teacher. This is always there. I, by the way, in all the years I went to school, I never saw anybody draw a picture on a blackboard that says teacher under it. This is one of those uh, continuing myths that whenever an ad man decides to make a layout in uh, you know an ad for the for the post, they always have this blackboard that says teacher. It shows this stick figure. I've never once, I never did. Do you? Did any of you ever see that in school? Never. Never. I didn't. If you did, I'll tell you, you better be very careful. Examine your memory again and see whether or not you're beginning to confuse the myth of the ad with what actually happened to you. Now, I have gone to ball games. These are, there are a lot of myths like this. I've gone to ball games since I was a very small child. My dad took me to ball games before I could even go to school. And I've been going to ball games, playing in ball games, and being involved in ballparks ever since that time to the present day. And do you know that in all those years, I have never once heard anybody holler, Kill the Empire! I have never heard anybody holler, Kill the Empire. And yet, every cartoon that you see about baseball shows somebody hollering, Kill the Umpire. And so, this is part of that same myth of the, you know, the stick figure that says, Teacher. Well, I had all these ideas about school. See, I was all excited. Now, the school that I was going to go to was about four or five blocks, or maybe three blocks, I shouldn't say, for about three blocks down the, down the street from us. And it was a big uh, brick building, big brick school. It sort of sat on the corner, and it had, I remember the uh, one thing about it that I always remember vividly, it had a fire escape that was one of these circular slide-type fire escapes. Have you ever seen those? They're a circular slide that comes down the back of the building. And it's a real slide. Just If you take a, a, a kindergarten slide, you know, the kind of slide that uh, that you see in, uh, in uh, parks, in amusement parks, or rather in uh, uh, playgrounds, if you took a slide like that and made it into a corkscrew shape, it had a slide. Now, I've never seen another one, although when I tell people that, they all look at me amazed. But that, that, uh, that our school had this slide that came right down. It was about a four-story school building. It was a big building. This is not country school, friends. It's a big uh, city building. And it had a slide that came right down. It was four stories high. And it had, of course, the slide was enclosed, so you couldn't fly out or anything like that. It was enclosed. It was, if you can imagine, it was enclosed. And it, had, it was open on the top. But you just get in this thing and you slide down it. And it was a slide. Now, uh, each... Each floor had an entrance to it. You just open this entrance, you jump in it, and you slide down. Now, I think that's damned a genius. <laughs> I really was. And so this thing was on the back of the building there. And, of course, in back of it, they had a playground, and they had the usual stuff you see around the school with a fence around it and all that. And it was the William McKinley School. The William McKinley School. And so, or is it Warren McKinley? William McKinley. William McKinley. And I would see the school. We would go past it all the time when we would go shopping and stuff like that. I'd see the school. And uh, this is the school I'm going to go to, the William McKinley School. And I see a lot of kids running around out there. And, of course, being a little kid, they all looked like big kids to me. And they were big kids compared to me. See, they were all running around. There would be thousands of kids there. And one or two kids in the neighborhood who were older than I was were already going to school. And they seemed, to, they, they seemed to occupy a world that was so exotic and, uh, and uh, 
I don't know, exciting. And all I would do at, you know, at home, I was a kid at home, not going to school, would be sort of move, fool around. And, you know, a little kid before he goes to school, he fools around. And, and uh, that's about all you do. You play and, you, and uh, you just fool around. And so the big day finally arrived. It was one week after Labor Day. And all that weekend, my mother says, you know, I'm going to go to school Monday. And I don't know the details of whether she went down before that and, and enrolled me or what. I mean, you, there must have been something like that. But Monday morning, I was going to go to school. And all that Saturday, we went out and went shopping, and my mother bought all kinds of, you know, I had these, uh, you, you buy stuff that you wear to school, school clothes, what they call school clothes. And boy, I was all excited. My kid brother was bugged. Oh, was he bugged. Because I was going to school. He wasn't. And uh, I remember going into stores and we're walking around and, and uh, my kid brother yelling every five minutes, he wanted one tool, whatever I got, he wanted. My mother kept saying, well, look, he's going to school. You're not going to school. <laughs> Even then, he was becoming the world's greatest whiner. He was working on it. Well, it is now Sunday. I got all these new school clothes, all excited. And there was a kid next door named Bobby Twyman who lived next door to us at the time, he was also going to school. And we were going to go to school together the following day, which was Monday morning. And our mothers were going to take us to school. Well, boy, I'll tell you, all that night, I remember my Aunt Min was over that day, that uh, that Sunday she was over for dinner, and they're all saying, oh, the school, hmm. He, he said, our little schoolboy, all that jazz, you know, and, uh, <laughs> you know, you know, auntie type talk. And so... The next morning, it's 8 a.m. or 7 a.m., whatever it was that I got up, and I'm having breakfast. I'm all dressed up, which was totally unusual for a kid. You know, up to this point, uh, no kid ever gets, uh, when you, before you go to school, you don't get dressed up. You wear your overalls or coveralls or whatever you wear. And uh, here it is. It is now 8 in the morning. I'm all dressed up, and I've got my brand-new go-to-school clothes. At the, my kid brother's sitting there at the breakfast table. He's mad. We're both eating the oatmeal. And out we go. It was a beautiful, sunny day. I remembered, and now I'm not inventing it. I'm not, I'm not ad-libbing this. I'm telling you the truth. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing out the memories as clearly as I can. It was a bright, sunny day. Now, I remember, <laughs> the, the, later on in the story, you realize why I remember why it was bright and sunny. It was a bright, sunny day. And we went next door and knocked on the door, and Bobby Twyman and his mother came on. I remember she was a tall, skinny lady with yellow hair. And so Bobby Twyman, all dressed up, we went down the street. And uh, it was Monday morning. There were a lot of other kids on the street. You could see other mothers. And we started to head to the William McKinley School. Well, the next, there is, an, uh, there is a deletion in the script. I do not recall, I remember starting out, I do not recall what happened, whether we went to the office or what. I remember the next moment, the next memory I recall is a lady, not my mother, but a lady, now is taking me and taking Bobby, and we are walking along a hallway. You got that memory. And she has our hand, and my mother has disappeared. Now, there was a moment of trepidation. I remember this. <laughs> and I see, you know, we're in the school, and there's all kinds of uh, kids, to all of them. And this lady has both of us by our hands. Now, I think at that point, I am figuring she's going to take us to where the school is. We're going to go now to that place that I've always thought of as school, that room with the desks, and there would be this blackboard, and there would be pencils, and the... Uh, we would read, and we would do all these groovy things. Well, she has us by the hand. She takes us to a door. That's quite right. She did take it. And I remember the door even. It had glass panes on the top, and the bottom was like solid, light, birch-colored wood. It was a very bright-colored door, birch wood, and it had glass panes, about six running up, you know, all glass, little glass panes with wood crisscrosses, cross uh, bars in it. And she opened the door, and another lady, 
who has forever enshrined in my eternal memories this big, fat lady wearing a purple dress, and her hair was all fuzzy on the top of her head, and she had glasses. She took Bobby Twyman and lifted him up and held Bobby Twyman, like, under her arm. And she took my hand, and she took us right into that room. And that was the beginning of the whole, the whole life. That was the, actually the beginning of life itself. That was the first room. The first cube. That section of air. That little contained bit of space that I was to occupy and all the other clearances of the world beginning it at that instant were beginning the world of official life offices schools auditoriums all the things that we occupy outside of our our own little private world of home the official world those buildings, and those buildings will pursue us all the way to the end of our life. Those official places, this was the very first one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you like that concept, don't you? But it is true. And I stood there for a second, and the lady said, well, why don't you go down and, and uh, you know, get in with the rest of the kids. Now, here, this is, this is Jeannie. She called me that, and from that day on, I was plagued with that. This is Jeannie, and here's Bobby. It was our first day in kindergarten. And I remember, I will always remember, and in fact, vividly remember, the intense shock and great wave of disappointment. There were no desks. There wasn't a desk in the entire room. They never show pictures of kindergarten in magazines. It's always the grade school they show. And I didn't know that. To me, school to school it was kindergarten. And there were sandboxes. Sandboxes! There were little girls sitting around cutting stuff out. There were thousands of kids all sitting around playing in sandboxes. And Miss Bundy, and that was her name, Miss Bundy took me over to a sandbox and said, Here, I want you to meet another little boy. His name is Schwartz. There was, I had never known, these were all, you know, little did I realize that this was lifelong things starting. And there's this kid sitting in a sandbox, looking mad too. <laughs> and, and about five minutes later, I'm sitting by the sandbox, I don't know what to do, you know, they're the sandbox there. And Miss Bundy, of course, is up, all the other new kids are being brought in by whoever it was that was bringing them in. Uh, from the uh, induction center, or whatever it was. <laughs> About every couple of seconds, another kid would come come in with a stunned look on his face. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, and suddenly they bring in Helen Weathers. This is Helen Weathers. I want you to say hello to Helen, all of you. And Helen sat down. She's looking at the sandbox. They brought in Esther Jane. They brought in Flick. The whole bunch. It was our whole crowd was beginning, see. But none of us knew each other before that. This was the whole big neighborhood. And so we're sitting there in the sandbox. And I remember this terrible feeling of disappointment. And then Miss Bundy walked over to the windows. I remember this moment. Again, there's kind of a blur. I don't know whether I played with the sand. I just remember being disappointed with the sand. I didn't, you know, I don't want to come to school to play the sand. And Miss Bundy opened the windows. And she said, now, boys and girls, the first thing I did in school, I remember doing it. She says, now, boys and girls, the first thing we're going to do 
we're going to sing a song. How many of you like to sing? I just looked up, sing a song. I never say, you know, sing. This is, I don't sing. How many of you like to sing? Ah, I see. Well, that's very good. Some of the kids have had their hand up. There's always kids that got their hand up instantly. Little did I realize that that was a thing that was going to plague me all my life. In every crowd, there's five people who perpetually got their hands up. Now, when I play for you at the piano, I want all of you now to sing the words that I will sing. Now, you listen to me as I sing. You repeat after me what I am singing. Won't that be fun? And Miss Bundy was a big, fat, round, jovial lady. And uh, later on, I, I, I didn't, didn't realize it, of course, at the time. She was just a big, fat, round lady to me. But later on, I learned she was a beloved kindergarten teacher and one of the most respected, incidentally, in the whole area there. And she loved kids. And so she sits down at this piano, and she starts to play the piano. She goes, bum, 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 bum. Oh, I am here in school. Bum, bum, bum. Now sing it, boys and girls. Oh, I am here in school. Bum, bum. And I'm singing, and I notice instantly all the girls are singing. The boys are sitting. <laughs> <laughs> Just now, come on now, all of you. Even the, oh, come on, all the boys too. All you boys too. Now let's go. Now here we go. Now, bum 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 bum. And she's banging away at the piano. Well, she played this song, and I was in total misery. Complete mis First of all, I was embarrassed. I don't know why I was embarrassed, because I didn't like to sing in front of all the other kids, because I couldn't sing good. And uh, I sat there, and I saw this kid, Schwartz. He's sitting there, too. <laughs> See, he's looking mad. There's another guy named Flick. And they're playing a the piano. Then, after the piano playing was over, Miss Bundy said, Now, boys and girls, the next thing we are going to do, and... Uh, I would like to ask all of you, each one of you in turn, I want all of you to say your name. Say your name when I point to you. Just say your name so that all the other children will know your name. Won't that be fun? Now, all right, now. See, she always said, won't that be fun? <laughs> that was always bad news. So, uh, won't that be fun? And so she points to this little girl. She says, Mr. Jean. Oh, boys and girls, now, did you hear what she said? She said her name was Esther Jane. Isn't that a nice name? Esther Jane, that's a very pretty name. Are you named after your mother or your father? <coughs> that's a very nice name. Now, uh, <laughs> so she worked all the way down the line. <laughs> and finally, she came to me. And this was the first of a long series of traumas that began. She said, what is your name? Jean. She says, oh, isn't that nice? Now, you see, his name is Eugene. Isn't that a nice name? Yeah, it's Jean. She says, yes, but you see, Jean is short for Eugene. And uh, well, you can all call him Jean if he wants to be called Jean. But, see, that's a very pretty name. I once knew a man named Eugene. In fact, uh, I would like to read to you a poem someday by a man named Eugene Field, who wrote a very pretty poem about a little toy soldier. Now, uh, are you named after him? Is your father's name Eugene? I never heard the name Eugene in my life. My name is not Eugene, it's Gene, J-E-A-N, Gene. I don't know what was going on already. I'm falling behind in school over my own name. I'm lousing up on my own name. She said, all right, very good. Well, if you want us to call you Gene, we will call you Gene. And, uh, that's a very pretty name. Eugene is one of my favorite names. And so we moved on down the line, calling out our names. Well, it was going downhill. 
school was not panning out. In fact, the song, we started to slide down, now the business of the names. Well, now we've been sitting now in school for about an hour, maybe, with the song and the names, and she talked to us a little bit. And then came the crusher, the total crusher. Miss Bundy said, and now, boys and girls, it's time. What do you think it's time for? Well, I figured we're going to get to it now. I put my hand up. She says, yes, Eugene? I figure she's calling on somebody behind me. And I turn around. She says, yes, Eugene, what do you think it is time for now? This was my first effort at the at class recitation. And I remember because, you know, this became a family story. She said, that, what are we ready for? And I said, reading. We're going to read. She said, no, that's not, not, not right. We're not going to read. But the, would you, uh, uh, you like to read? I said, yes. She says, well, we're a little young for that here yet. But no, we're not going to read. And I could see the other kids looking at me and say, already I'm embarrassed. I, I booted my first question. Oh, it's terrible to boot your first one. That was only the beginning of a whole lifetime of it, you know. So I kicked the first one right out the window. And we're all sitting there dumbly looking up at her in the sandbox. I remember I was knee-deep in sand. And she says, all right, boys and girls, I'll tell you what it's time for. What is it that all of you have? at this time of day, at home, right at the middle of the morning. What do you have? What do you do? That's right. You take a nap. Ah! <laughs> a nap! Oh! Oh. oh, man, if there's anything from the time I was hatched out of the egg. If there was anything that bugged me more than a nap, I'd like to know what it was. A nap. And here I figured that I was getting out of all that. Now I was in school. I was with the other people. And we're going to take a nap. And so Miss Bundy rolled out blankets all over the floor. And I watched her as she rolled them. And all of us lay down on the floor in kindergarten with the shades drawn. I just lay there. A nap. This was school. This was school. And I couldn't sleep. I never, I, we, I never took a nap in the morning, by the way. All of a sudden, I'm taking naps in the morning. I'm a little kid again. I'm laying there looking up at the ceiling. Schwartz is laying it next to me. He's looking up at the ceiling. And I heard him say, rats. Schwartz said, rats. <laughs> I said, yeah, rats. We just lay there looking up at the ceiling. And napped. That, that moment, that moment of, of oppressive boredom, that moment of irritation, of having been had, that tremendous sense of disappointment, no reading, no desk, no books, nothing but sand piles, naps, little girls, and a big fat lady banging on the piano, singing, Oh, I am here in school, bonk, bonk. How I love to be in school. Oh, oh, school, well, it is fun. How I love school. Oh, oh. And that night, that night, that night, I threw... The first tantrum I ever had in my life. Do you remember when you were a kid throwing a tantrum? 
I remember. Why is it I remember these things? I was. I remember being on the floor, screaming and rolling under the daybed. I was not going to go back. That's what this tantrum was about. My mother said, "Did you like it?" I said, "No." She says, "Well, you're going back tomorrow." And I said, "Tomorrow." In other words, to me, it was. I was not used to yet not being able to not go back. I said, no, no. And I started a fight. There was a yelling and hollering and screaming. And the next thing you know, I'm under the daybed. I remember my old man reaching in under the daybed and dragging me out like some kind of a rat, <laughs> fighting and kicking, <laughs> holding me up in the air. And that was the first day of school. I never did dig kindergarten. I hated every day of it. Every day of that lousy sandbox. And then two days later, they started to give us not only a nap, but we also got graham crackers and warm milk. <laughs> it was even next thing I figured. You know, they were going to bring the nipples in. You know, with the bottles. Now I don't know whether girls felt this way, but the one thing boys didn't want to be was kids, was babies. And that first day of school has remained always in my mind. And no matter how old you are, or how much of a kid you are, if you look really carefully in that vast pile of trivia, that garbage heap of memory, you will find your first day of school, that first major trauma of the official world.